Just so we have uh, some time left, let's talk about our paper. <coughs> I was a little busy with stuff this weekend, so I didn't get to read this very carefully. So let's, um, I'll ask you guys to have any, if you had any particular questions about it. And I, I know a little bit about it because I've heard it at a meeting talking about it, but let's see if we have anything to talk about. It. What do they mean in the first page? It says, uh, in particular, the, re the reduced capacity, capacity, capacitative and resistive effects associated with small electrodes have allowed large perturbation methods. And again, such a single voltage, why do they call it large perturbation? Yeah, it's a little bit of a fancy talk, I guess. <laughs> what they're talking about is, Perturbation, it, whenever you do an experiment with a potential change or a current change, you're, what you're doing is you're perturbing it from equilibrium and then observing a sort of response to try to re return to equilibrium. Uh, and you can do large changes, large perturbations or small perturbations. So in this case, uh, cyclic voltammetry, you really change the conditions dramatically from equilibrium. You, you can, and, you know, going from some concentration at the electrode surface to maybe a zero concentration at the electrode surface. You really change it a lot, so that's a large perturbation. On the other hand, you can have a perturbation like a differential pulse voltammetry where your, where your net is, you're close to essentially equilibrium all along this baseline, but you're pulsing just a little bit above equilibrium, so you're just sort of tickling it away from equilibrium and then re letting it relax. And so these are smaller, so the pulse methods are you may apply a, an alternating uh, voltage on the, on the signal, uh, technique called AC voltammetry, which we're, we won't have time to talk about, but same idea. So that's the, what they mean by perturbation methods. The, they're just talking about microelectrodes having small capacities and resistances compared to big electrodes. And so that means that they can be used at higher time, uh, shorter time scales. So they don't have to worry so much about the self-filtering effect of the RC time constant. And that's another thing, that the it's not very clear to me is what do they call by bad run. I thought it was current coming from some kind of a reduction from the solvent, but I think that that's not exactly what you talk about all the time. But like they say that uh, false methods would reduce background. I've uh, listened, I've read that so much. So what do they hear? They say in the first page, uh, as, uh, the second call. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of that paragraph, the first one says, making background subtraction procedures mandatory from electrode response yeah. capacity coverage. Do they mean, what, what do you mean there by background subtraction? Well, you remember when we talk about voltammetry that there's always a capacitive current that flows, even if it's not very apparent that slow scans, it becomes large at peak current is proportional to V to the one half, but the capacitive current is proportional to the scan rate. So as we scan faster and faster, the capacitive current becomes the larger fraction of the signal. So you might see a this curve like this, where here's your peaks, but there's a large capacitive current. So they're saying you have to subtract off that background current. There are two kinds of background. Yeah, uh, it's background can mean capacitive current, and it can also mean in some reaction that is not uh, desired occurring. Usually, it's talking about something that's a slow, a relatively slow reaction, but uh, is present as enough current flow that it causes some some 
some interference with the signal that you want to observe. Now, what they're saying there is when you do, when you change the electro potential very rapidly, you often have other currents that flow that are not the Faradayic current of interest that you have to subtract off. That's because of this current and capacitance. That's the tip, that's the really the, the major problem they've got. <clears throat> yeah. is, is that electrode suitable for studying like chemical reactions following the electron transfer? So according to the way that they just they they bump the solution or like spray the solution on the surface. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? What is that? Is that that's what it is? Yeah. Is that something or this is just what they can get out of that kind of electrodes? What they are talking about is that you can get mass transfer at a higher rate, maybe much better than the... the well, right. Uh, you remember the uh, talking about, we just talked about mass transfer rates, kinetic. So their, their velocity is, is, as they say, is up to 25 meters per second or in centimeters per second, that would be 2,500 centimeters per second, right? And as we said, if Kf M0 or over M0 is much, much greater than one, we can um, study the, uh, uh, let's see, chemical effects. Much, much less than one, I should say. Then kinetic effects can be studied. So in other words, if we have a KF of 250, in principle, we should be able to, if you assume that velocity is the mass transfer coefficient, which it actually isn't, but that's the idea. We, if, if we make the mass transfer coefficient very fast by impinging the solution very rapidly, on the system, we can study rapid rates of electron transfer because we're now the KF value can be quite large and still see the effect that we're interested in. But you're asking about chemical kinetics. And chemical kinetics, what you should be able to study is. <coughs> Well, I'm not sure that you could study directly chemical processes that are accompanying the electron transfer. You'd have to couple in some other method along with it. This is principally good for studying electron transfer kinetics. If they, um, they talk about uh, the highest mass transfer rate in figure five is mass transfer coefficient of about 0 0.55 point, uh, reciprocal centimeter, rec centimeters per reciprocal seconds, <coughs> okay? So that flow rate is much, much higher than the actual mass transfer coefficient ends up being if you look at uh, uh, that system. So what that means is, is that 0.55 centimeters. So you need, so you just should be able to study rates of as fast as perhaps uh, 0.05 centimeters per second with good accuracy and maybe up to a couple tenths of a se centimeter per second with reasonable accuracy. Notice a uh, multi microelectrode with a radius of about 150 nanometers would be required to achieve the same mean rate of mass transfer in stationary solution. What that's saying is that, remember the equation for um, a microelectrode, it's for R N F D C. And if we look at uh, the, uh, the other, the limiting current, normally it's NF A C M0. 
So if you rearrange those two equations, you can see that the mass transfer here is on the order of the radius over the, uh, the diffusion coefficient over the radius. So that's, and then it has a pi, a pi in there somewhere. So by making the radius smaller, we can increase the mass transfer coefficient of our microelectrode. If you can, you see, see, so they're, what they're saying is that by having that jet impinging it, they have a rate of mass transfer that would be the same as a microelectrode of about 150 nanometers. And the way they did that was they compared the two to a microelectrode and uh, to an other microelectrode. And we were just talking about rotating disk electrodes. It would have to rotate at speeds of about 200,000 uh, 200, hertz, which isn't radians per second, but that's um, omega is equal to two pi f. So omega would be equal to, um, Yeah. Right. So it'd be um, omega over for. Um, Right, so it's 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 faster than they said the um, the than we said the the we could rotate it normally, and that's quite a bit faster. So these would have an advantage, for example, than the rotating disk electrode. Same, it's very similar, in other words, to the rotating disk electrode. It doesn't have it has the same sort of thing. You get a mass transport to the electrode surface. It sprays out the sides but we're just allowing a system that really has essentially no moving parts, much simpler physically. Uh, and you notice how do they, how do they change the, the uh, flow rate? You may remember that. Simple, simple gravity sometimes. Yeah, they just change the Behind. gravitational. And the only real tricky part is making the jet. And, a given, a given diameter. So it's pretty simple physically. And, uh, and they have some, you know, they, trans they calculate some things to, they didn't have a, a real theory at this point about what it should be. They knew what the uh, flow condition should be for laminar conditions. In other words, so they don't have turbulence in the system. But that's about all they had. So what they did is they compared the results to microelectrodes where they knew the actual mass transfer coefficients and made analogies t based on those two systems from equation five. This wall tube electrode, the one that we mentioned here, the one that we just talked about in the class, wall and... Yeah, it's, a, it's essentially a wall jet electrode like we talked about. It's uh, because of the because of the um, system, it's slightly, it's slightly different than a wall jet electrode. If you notice, uh, the electrode is characterized by. Oh, which one of the most consistent of that for conventionally says wall tube electrode? Uh, a similar idea. Wall tube is is. Um, same idea. You just have a tube of material above a above an electrode. So it's a it's basically the same thing. The electrode is um, uniformly accessible again, which means again that the uh, the current distribution is the same over the entire electrode, making it simple to understand the kinetic processes. Now, the half a centimeter per second, pretty good probably could make it uh, faster, as I said, by making smaller electrodes, smaller nozzles, and making the electrodes uh, smaller as well.
Any other um, any other questions about that? So just another example of um, what kind of that's one that kind of been a um, kind of been a theme of electrochemistry in the last 10, 15 years is minimizing the sensors and, and the parts and seeing what happens. A lot of uh, previous work because of physical constraints and electronics really they worked with larger electrodes and so on because they were easier to work with, they didn't have the methods and the ways to do that. Now since they do, we have ways of moving electrodes very carefully and, and making small tubes and jets like this what happens when we do that. So a lot of old-fashioned experiments can be revisited with some new techniques like this one. This is a simple wall tube electrode, but because they can make the nozzle smaller and they have a way to move that nozzle very carefully at a given distance away from an electrode that's on the order of microns, they can improve things quite easily. Now, I said there's no moving parts. In fact, there is a moving part. You have to have a positioner to get that there. But in principle, you could use a manual positioners, which are reasonably inexpensive, less expensive than, say, one rotating disk electrode would be. <laughs> which, uh, so a rotating ring disk electrode is over nine hundred dollars. So, very a uh, good one, a very ex uh, very expensive. So, but it's still still new, so it's not yet. It's not something that people are using all the time. But we may see it. All right, why don't we stop here then and uh, see you next week. So read up on uh, chapter 10 and um, it wouldn't hurt you to start reading the next one, which I forget. It's in the syllabus though. <laughs>